Hello, I'm Dr. Sylvia Pastor. Hello, I'm Dr. Jimmy Miller. Hi, I'm Professor Beth Kitts, and we are the coordinators of the Rhone State Honors Program. Welcome to the Spring 2021 Virtual Honors Forum. The Rhone State Community College Honors Program provides a unique opportunity for the college's most promising students. Each student works with their professor to develop a project which ventures beyond the regular content of the course, providing a deeper level of learning. Our honors students work hard, raise questions, and seek answers. Their projects take on a variety of forms, from creating a collection of poems or piece of artwork, to writing a research paper or conducting an experiment, or giving a presentation, just to give a few examples. This program will showcase just a small selection of the many recently completed quality projects. We would like to thank all of the students in the honors program, all of the Rhone State faculty and instructors who have worked with our students, and all of the supporting staff from librarians to lab techs that help make this program possible. To learn more about the honors program, please visit rhonestate.edu forward slash honors program or search honors from the Rhone State homepage. Hello, I'm Dr. Chris Whaley, president of Rhone State Community College. I'm so excited to welcome you to this year's virtual honors forum. Please enjoy this selection of honors projects, and please join me in saluting and congratulating these Rhone State students for their academic endeavors. Hello, I'm Dr. Diane Ward, Vice President for Student Learning and Chief Academic Officer. Every year we recognize students who have completed honors projects under the mentorship of Rhone State faculty members. Our students continue to impress us with their creativity and curiosity, especially this year as so many students connected with their instructors online due to the pandemic. This year, as every year, we applaud our students on their honors projects. Hello, I'm Autumn Edwards from the Cumberland County campus. Um, I'm currently a general studies major in middle college, and I did this project over the women's suffrage movement for my History 2020 class. Um, the women's suffrage movement started in you know, the mid 19th century and it represented reform. Uh, people who supported the movement wanted to have the same voting rights as men had, uh, which was unheard of at the time. The movement lasted for decades and until the 20th century when the 19th amendment finally did pass. Uh, the World Anti-Slavery Conference was one of the first things that led to the widespread women's suffrage movement. Um, two American abolitionists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, uh, wished to attend but were refused seats because it was an all-male event. And that, that led to them wanting to start their own conference uh, for women's rights. The first uh, U.S. Women's Rights Convention uh, took place in Seneca Falls. Most people know about this one, and it was the first step towards women's right to vote. Uh, the organizers were Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and at the convention, many signed a document called the Declaration of Sentiments that was formatted in a similar way to the Declaration of Independence and became an outline of what was expected to come from the women's rights movement. Two years after the Seneca Falls Convention, the first national women's rights convention took place in Massachusetts. It brought people from all Northern states um, and was a wide gathering, unlike how Seneca Falls was pretty small. Many women's rights activists were also abolitionists and one of them was Sojourner Truth, uh, who is widely known for the Ain't I a Woman speech that she gave at the 1851 Women's Rights Convention in Ohio. And the speech just highlighted the unfair treatment that female slaves received and brought even more awareness to women's rights and the suffrage movement overall. When the Civil War took place from 1861 to 1865, the movement was halted um, given that most women were also um, abolitionists. They supported you know, all that. So they started putting their efforts towards the war instead of focusing so much on the women's right to vote. But when the Civil War did end, the American Equal Rights Association was formed. Uh, the association focused on abolishing slavery and universal suffrage. Uh, the association, though, started to split when the 14th and 15th Amendments were ratified because um, one of them focused on just, you know, it didn't give everybody the right to vote. And some of the supporters, like, they didn't want that. They wanted to have everyone be able to vote, not just certain marginalized groups. So when the major you know, association split, 
Uh, the National Women's Suffrage Association was created by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and it was made to organize opposition against the 15th Amendment and to organize support for a national or for women's suffrage move, amendment. Uh, it also focused on radical ideas of the time, like divorce, that were very you know, taboo topics. Uh, and then also when uh, the association split, the American Woman Suffrage Association um, was led by Lucy Stone and her husband, Henry Blackwell, and it advocated uh, state amendments for women's suffrage rather than a federal amendment. And it also solely focused on suffrage, unlike the other or association that uh, was more radical. Then a speech uh, written by Matilda Jocelyn Gage and Elizabeth Cady Stanton was delivered by Susan B. Anthony on July 4th, 1876. It was called the Declaration of Rights of the Women of the United States, and it focused on women's status as non-citizens by highlighting women's lack of civil and political rights. Uh, and it was specifically delivered on July 4th, 1876, because that was 100 years since uh, the United States became a nation. Then in January 1878, Senator Aaron Paul introduced a women's suffrage amendment to Congress. And around this time, other states were starting to let women have voting rights, but there were restrictions about what elections they could vote in and everything like that. But it did become a step towards what would become the 19th Amendment. The two main popular associations regarding women's suffrage previously mentioned did end up merging and became the National American Woman Suffrage Association. It was led by the daughters of the original two organizations leaders. And then in 1913, a group of suffragists marched on Washington DC the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. Uh, one of the people in it was Jeanette Rankin, who was the first woman in history to be elected into the House of Representatives. Uh, the parade turned very violent, but that didn't stop any you know, more parades from happening. Uh, the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage was formed in 1913 by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, and their goal was to lobby for the passage of a federal women's suffrage amendment, and they created the National Women's Party and used a direct action campaign with violence and protests and everything to fight for suffrage, and their methods are much of the reason why the 19th Amendment actually did pass. Then, you know, the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920 and it finally granted women the right to vote. And when that passed, of course, the women's suffrage movement finally came to an end because women were finally legally allowed voting, voting rights and it was written in the Constitution and it was a victory amongst all the people that had been struggling for it for the past 70 years. And then nowadays, even though, you know, this might not seem like a major topic, it's been now a little over 100 years since the 19th Amendment passed, and we're still being taught the women's suffrage movement in school books and museums, um, and it's a defining moment for women's rights overall. Many minorities and everything like that would not be having, you know, fair, wouldn't be treated fairly regarding voting rights and even amongst other things if it weren't for the women's rights movement. And this picture is actually from uh, the Smithsonian. And it was a trip that I took with uh, some of my middle college peers. And we basically uh, were, in re were in this reenactment of a protest that happened um, you know, during those times. And of course, this is my work cited and everything. Um, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Julian Seninocencio. Uh, the, my campus is Cumberland Campus, Harriman Campus. Spent a bit of time at both of those campuses. And um, after I graduate here at Run State, I intend to transfer to TTU in Cookville to study mechanical engineering and uh, should be graduating this semester at the end of the semester. So I'll be going there in the fall. Uh, so my project was looking at the cumulative torque output between uh, internal combustion engines and electric engines, or electric motors, rather. Um, I've always said that there was there was something to grasp there, those two different motors and how they produce torque and therefore power. Um, so the conventional power outputs are actually the maximum power at a certain RPM. Those are the conventional ways of describing the the power the motor produces. And I see it as kind of a flawed system because you're only seeing the power that's being used like when you're when you're driving erratically. It's not regular. 
Um, so I thought a better way to look at what I'm capable of is to look at the, um, the cumulative torque. So that's basically the torque produced from zero RPMs all the way up to an engine or motor's maximum. Uh, what I found was that the electric motor, it produces torque from zero RPMs all the way up, whereas an internal combustion motor, it only produces torque from about a thousand RPMs, maybe a little over that to its maximum RPM. And what that does is it, it, it has a big hole of where you're not producing power throughout the RPM. And what that ended up leading me to find, I compared two motors and the electric motor produced 34.2% more torque or power than the internal combustion engine. And I attributed that similarly to the amount of RPMs that are lost that would have potentially produced torque had it been an electric motor. So uh, that's basically the, uh, the concept. And I figured that these findings could be used by automotive manufacturers as they begin to roll out electric cars. And they could use this information to convey the value of electric power and how more usable it is in every uh, everyday instance. It's not something that you know you might you might hit the red line in your vehicle twice in the time you own it. Who knows? You know people are different, um, but that would make it to where customers can really appreciate the quality of uh, engineering that goes into electric cars. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, if anyone has any questions, they can. Feel free to contact me through my email or anything like that. The faculty members I would like to thank for help on this project would be uh, Dr. Yan, uh, Dr. Miller, Jimmy Miller, uh, and also Professor Miller, Jillian Miller. I'd like to also thank Deborah Miles. They've all helped me to uh, really grasp a lot of mathematical understandings and be able to, to do something like this. I'd really appreciate it. My name is Jing and I'm majoring in health science and my goal is to become a nutritionist in the future. And I'm from the Oak Ridge campus and I work with Dr. Pastor on this honors project that is about um, anthocyanin and its properties, which is talking about acid and bases. So why did I do this project? Okay, the reason is in our daily life, we have, we've been, we use like, um, acid to base stuff to um food for examples and um like soaps so it's interesting to know um their properties and also um i came across this video online while researching on this topic and it actually can uh change the color of the anthocyanin so i just did a a video that shows that um, for the acid one is gonna make it red, but depending on how how much the acidity is, the color will be darker or even lighter. And for the one that's more basic, it will turn like really purple or maybe blue. So it's nice to know that um, what what we use and we can even use this in gardening and um, like to cure your stomach ache. They have medicines like that. And like um, to clean ourselves, we use basic stuff that's like soap. We do the dishes with soap, we clean our bodies with soap. So that's the project I worked on. I've decided to talk about bioluminescence for this project. What is bioluminescence, you may ask? Well, bioluminescence is the production and emission of light by living organisms. It's used by many organisms in the world, although we mainly see marine organisms using these specific reactions, such as bacteria, algae, sea stars, jellyfish, worms, fish, sharks, all that. <clears throat> the, the primary component in the reactions is luciferin. And here I have our two formulas for the firefly luciferin and snail luciferin. Each organism, each group of organisms uses a different type of 
organic substance to conduct these types of chemicals. Why do organisms use bioluminescence? Organisms use these use bioluminescence as methods of offense or defense. A few offensive methods are to lure uh, as an attracting a mate, to lure with external light, or to illuminate, such as fireflies do. Some use it as defense mechanisms, such as to startle, um, misdirect, to stun, or confuse, or even to emit warning or coloration against other animals or organisms. <laughs> Chemistry behind the reaction. Okay, to the right, I have a little chart that you can pause the video or however I'm presenting this and read it if you would like. But it basically breaks down how the bioluminescence and the luciferin and luciferase work together to make these chemical reactions happen. And I'll stay right here. Oh, also chemically, most bioluminescence is due to oxygenation reactions because the oxygen reacts with substance, substances called luciferins producing energy in the form of light. The reactions are catalyzed by enzymes known as luciferases. In this process, the luciferins become oxygenated and for oxyluciferin, which is what this diagram shows. On the slide are the different types of fire or luciferin. There's firefly luciferin, which is obviously found in fireflies. Flashia luciferin, which is found in freshwater snails. Bacterial luciferin, which is found in back, well, many of the bacteria we see. Cohen luciferin, dinoflagellate luciferin, which is found in dinoflagellates. Bargulin luciferin and fox fire luciferin, which is also known as the bioluminescence that fungi use. And this is over here as an example of the different types of chemicals that bioluminescence can produce. <clears throat> Most or the colors that can be emitted by bioluminescence are usually green, red, and blue. And it works with the, wave, the wavelengths that the organism can emit, which is a chart I have to the side. Marine organisms tend to emit blue light, so it's between 450 and 495, <coughs> respectively. And then terrestrial species emit more of the green um, bioluminescence, and then some dinoflagellates found in like the tides emit, emit red, which is also that creates the phenomenon of the glowing waves. I will now be going over red light emission, which is the most uncommon. And the animals featured are the spotlight, loose jaw, and the gonulax. The spotlight loose jaw is the only fish to have the ability to produce red light that we know of. It emits a rosy glow from its organs located near its eyes to use in order for prey, in order to secretly hunt its prey in the ocean. Most other deep, this works because most other deep sea water fish are unable to see the red light being emitted. The gonulax is the dinoflagellates I mentioned earlier. These create the phenomenon of the red tide we see many times when we go to the beach. And the chemicals they emit is, can actually be very poisonous if humans in, um, ingest them or if fish ingest them, but not just by touch usually. Blue light emission is the most common type often found in marine life, and it rarely ever occurs on land. And the two featured animals are the anglerfish and the moon jellyfish. I added a little picture from Nemo where I first saw the anglerfish. Um, they have a lighted dangling lure that looks a lot like a worm, as you can see from this diagram. <laughs> And the glow actually doesn't come from anglerfish itself, but it comes from the luminous bacteria that live in its lure. I don't know if you can see this cursor inside the lure. And they use it to attract prey. Now the moon jellyfish has a very ferocious sting, often found on the beaches. 
It is used as, the sting is used as defense against predators and they drift with the currents, but there is no known use for their bioluminescence as of right now besides just attracting in prey. And lastly, our green and yellow light emission where the lights are so bright green that they just tend to look like tone yellow. So that's why I say slash. Um, they are mainly found in terrestrial organisms and this section includes the firefly and the bitter oyster. Oyster, my bad. First up we have the firefly. The firefly glow to find a mate and they often communicate with their own species such as we see them doing all the time outside. And some can even mimic other species lights in order to track attract in like a mate, but then they will kill them because the mate thought it was from their species. And they're not actually, fireflies aren't actually considered flies. They're marked off as beetles. The bitter oyster. The bitter oyster is often found on decaying wood a recent study states these mushrooms turn themselves into a neon color in order to attract insects. They are, they are found in on land, of course, and most plants aren't truly bioluminescent. Now for this last section, it's a special section. These are the species that can emit more than one light. There aren't very many, but I have a few here. <laughs> And these, organ these two organisms can actually control the type of light they emit, like which one back and forth. So first up, I have the glowing sucker octopus. And then next will be the railroad worm. So the glowing sucker octopus, it emits blue and red lights. The blue lights are on top and serve no known purpose, but the red lights are on the bottom and are used to draw and prey. If the Octopus has to use two different kinds of reactions, chemical reactions for each type of luciferin. So this requires them to be able to control the type they emit. And they use it to lure into the red to lure in prey. Lastly, we have the railroad worm. Um, they are able to emit both a red and a yellowish slash greenish light that we mentioned earlier. And their tactics are often for offensive or defensive. So like to attract a mate or to warn predators to hang off the ledge. Like when they're coming in, they turn into beetles for their adult life. And there's no sign of bioluminescent use as I have above this picture them as an adult where their bioluminescence reactions either go away or they no longer are able to control them. And these are the final, this is the final con the conclusion of the, my project. Um, bioluminescence truly lights up our worlds in more ways than we ever knew before, more than I ever knew before. Um, this, is all, this is all able to happen because of all the different types of luciferin that are very complex and that goes on in every organism to make this possible. But there's still very much learn about bioluminescence and new studies are coming out every day. So thank you for listening. My name is Laura Looney and I am a student at Roan State Community College and I elected to participate in the honors program for the fall 2020 and spring 2021 semesters. A little about me, I live in Crossville, Tennessee. The Cumberland campus is my home campus. I am in the paralegal studies program. If all goes as planned, I should graduate next spring with an Associates of Applied Science. I'm a member of Lambda Epsilon Chi, the National Honor Society for Members of the Legal Profession. I am also a member of Phi Theta Kappa, the International Honor Society for two-year colleges. And I am honored to serve as the president of the Rotaract Club for Rhone State's Cumberland campus. The first honors project I completed for the fall of 2020 was for my computer applications class with Professor Robert Safty. He allowed me to create a PowerPoint presentation over search engine optimiz optimization for entrepreneurs. Search engine optimization, or SEO for short, is the practice of increasing the quantity and quality of traffic to a website through organic search engine results. Some of the topics I covered were what exactly SEO is, the different types, 
the goals of SEO, how it works, why it's important, the stages of the SEO process, what search engines are, the types of website traffic, and finally, six tips and tricks for practical application for entrepreneurs. Here's a sample of the presentation. The project actually ended up being a total of 26 slides, and I was honored when Professor Safdie asked for my permission to share my project with the computer science faculty. The second honors project I completed for the fall of 2020 was another PowerPoint over Tennessee handgun permits and armed self-defense for my legal research class with Professor Michael Davis. Some of the topics I covered within this presentation were the types of handgun permits offered by Tennessee, statistics for the state, how one can obtain a permit, the application process, and what Tennessee law has to say about the use of deadly force in armed self-defense and the possible repercussions. This is a sampling of the presentation. This project was 27 slides, and this class actually had a Zoom lecture component so the professor asked me to present my project during one of our virtual class meetings. And finally, for spring of 2021, uh, actually over the winter term, I completed an honors project for my introduction to sociology class with Professor Jessica Dalton Carriger. She allowed me to create a total of four interactive infographics over a topic that is very important to me mental health and college students. I chose the infographic format because infographics are visual representations of information, data, and or knowledge presented in a quick and clear format. They can improve cognition by utilizing graphics to enhance the human visual system's ability to see patterns and trends. I myself am a very visual person and I wanted to present the information in a visually appealing manner. Some of the topics covered by the infographics were common stressors that college students experience, tips on how to manage stress, the services that are available through Roan State, um, the stigma associated with seeking help, and suicide prevention. The interactive component came into play with links embedded within the infographic shown here. A student could click on the email icon to send a request to speak with a counselor or click on the Facebook icon to be taken to the Facebook page for Roan State's counseling services. Or for more information, a student could click on the web icon to be directed to the counseling services page on the school's website. These are the rest of the infographics. And that's it. I really appreciate your time and attention today. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me at my Roan State email address at looneyll at roanstate.edu. And I would like to leave you with a quote from William Butler Yates. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations.